How is everybody? Good? All right. Good to, good to, good to see everybody. And um, this is also being recorded, and it will uh, end up um, online. And if you are, by chance, watching online, you can click into the description, and uh, we'll have the uh, paperwork that you can, that you can download. But let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will, uh, we will get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your grace. Thank you for the ability to be able to come in. Um, we prayed back behind the platform just a few minutes ago. Um, what a blessed people that we are to be able to come into an air-conditioned room with state-of-the-art sound system to be able to talk about your son. Um, I, I just pray that you would find us in our church good stewards of the days of prosperity that you have given to us. And I pray that we would, uh, we would always lift up your son and make sure that the gospel is preached in everything that we do. Um, Lord, we do realize that around our world um, today, and um, not, not only in just in the Middle East, but um, in our country, um, there's just a lot of turmoil and um, things going on. And Lord, at the end of the day, the, the way we're told to pray is that your kingdom would come. Lord, the, the answer to the problems um, in our world is Jesus. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you would, that you would bring peace um, in those areas that um, have such strife and uh, tensions and uh, the, the senseless killings and all of the stuff that goes on. I just pray, God, that somehow you would bring peace there. And, Lord, to our, to our own country that's in a lot of upheaval and a lot of fear, and I just I pray, God, that you would bring calming in your kingdom, um, Lord. And uh, I pray that you would help us to be vigilant in praying for our world and ultimately be praying that uh, the, the world will become a fertile place for the gospel and that Jesus will be lifted up. And as we pray for those things, uh, this, this evening we will be talking about your son. And I pray that uh, as we look at scripture again and look at the life of Christ, um, I, I pray that you would teach us, that you would equip us. Um, but most importantly, Lord, I pray that it would uh, be applied to our lives and that we would live out um, the gospel in a way that is pleasing to you. And uh, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, a couple of real quick things here as we, uh, as, as we, get, as we get going. Um, last week, and it will be the same as this week, we have a handout for everybody. Please make sure <clears throat> when you leave that you get the handout. Um, handout was great last week, right? Everybody enjoyed it? Yes, good stuff. Um, it'll be equally as good every week. Um, and what this does is it allows you just to listen. Um, rather than trying to take all kinds of notes, you'll, you'll have this uh, to look over and to, um, and I'll remind us of that at the uh, end of the uh, evening as well. A couple of real quick notes before we get into what we're doing. Um, this is the life of Christ. And we decided, Warren and I both, and Warren, great to have you again here. Everybody give Warren a hand clap. He's awesome. Wonderful. Thank Love you. you, man. Love you too. You know, um, and uh, so what we're going to do is we had decided that we were going to look at the Last Supper, the cross, and the resurrection as the first three units because within them, that we're, we're really getting at the heart of the gospel. Mm -hmm. We're really getting at the heart of who Jesus was in his life. And when we understand those three things, the other parts that of the gospel start place. to really fall in place. And so that's why we did what we did. And so um, this, this uh, week we'll be looking at the, at, the, at the cross. But I want to just do a really quick summary of, of last week. If you remember last week, we talked about the, the, the Last Supper. And what I want to draw attention to real quick, because you're going to see this over and over and over again um, in these sessions, and it will help all of us to learn to read Scripture differently. Um, we, we, we call it framing. The, the, the biblical writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, oftentimes frame something in between two things. And the cross is framed in between two suppers, the Last Supper and the Emmaus Supper. And the important thing to see is that framing, because we're going to see a lot of that again this evening. We're going to see that through all of this. And what you'll do is you'll start seeing and picking up these things that the biblical writers have done to help us to understand um, the whole idea of you know, what they're saying about Jesus. And so 
what we want to do is hopefully over the next, this week and next week, we want to really drill in to help us understand the gospel, mm-hmm. it, it, the good news and, and what that really means because we're convinced, and I, and I um, it's just, it, it is the deal, is that every story in the Bible is really teaching the gospel. Mm-hmm. It's Absolutely. teaching the suffering, suffering and the glory, and the glory. Of, of Christ. And when you start to see that, you'll start to see that all these stories, whether you're reading Samson or David or whatever you're reading, it's ultimately talking about Jesus, which is exactly what he said in John 5. He said that the Old Testament was about him. And that's probably one of the hardest things for Christians is to be able to locate Jesus in these stories. And what we're hoping is as we go through the life of Christ and we look at this, the gospel of suffering and glory and how all that works, You'll, you'll start to start reading that in Scripture for yourself. And when that happens, it's uh, um, absolutely incredible. So let's get to work here. Um, we need to talk about Jesus being a man. And, you know, if you hang around church long enough or you flip online or you talk to people, um, the question will invariably come up, if there's really a God and he can do whatever he wants to do, why did he have to send Jesus as a man? Why did he have to be the son of man and the son of God? Why did he have to come? Why did he have to die on a cross? I mean, couldn't have God just done something like this and made it all good? There's, there's got to be a reason why that's the way it is. Can you help us um, understand why Jesus needed to be a man, why he was the son of man and the son of God? Sure. I think that uh, that's a profound question. What we're going to see is the story that is behind the Last Supper, the meaning of the cross, the four evangelists, and the uh, resurrection. It's all about Adam. Adam, you'll see that tonight. Every story is, is a reflection on what we lost in Adam. Now, if we think about what the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, what that really meant, that's profound because, and I'm sure that heaven was stunned. We are creatures, we are finite creatures that God has made. But because we're finite, when we sin against God, our sin is an infinite sin. Does that make sense? If we offend an infinite God, even though we're finite, our sin itself is infinite. The Bible talks about sin Matthew talks, uh, Luke will talk about forgive us our trespasses, but Matthew will say forgive us our debts. Hmm. And sin is like a debt that we owe. And if our debt is against an infinite God, that means our debt is infinite. And the, the, the sin of Adam and Eve was infinite in its consequence, which meant that and from the very beginning, how do you pay an infinite debt if you're a finite creature? Hmm. You can't. You're undone. I mean, there's no way. If, if you never sinned again, if you, if you lived out your life in, in perfect goodness, you would never be able to atone for your own sin. If Adam had not fallen, perhaps he could have atoned for one other person, but Adam fell into sin too. So what, is, what can God do? God, God has established the rules by which we live and God is intending, because he's just, he must do righteousness, must, must be right. So when Adam and Eve sinned, their fall was, was without remedy. There is no solution for them. Um, the consequence was disastrous. It wasn't just for Adam and Eve. When they were commanded, remember, to be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and the, one of the first consequences of sin is the shame that comes, and here is a husband and a wife with no one else, and they're covering their sexual organs. Why? They instinctively realized that they had brought all of their, their offspring, through all the, the potential offspring, they had brought them under the sentence of, of death and under the reign of sin mm-hmm. as well, so we were born in an original sin. We were born as violators of God's law and under condemnation. I mean, that's a massive, massive uh, burden to carry if you think about it. They were separated from God. They were separated from one another. They began blaming each other. They were commanded to be fruitful and multiply, but that's all been upset. They were commanded to rule over the beast. 
But the serpent, which is a beast, had ruled over the woman who had ruled over the man. So, I mean, the ruination of the fall is without remedy. There is no remedy to that. Because, why is that the case? Sin, the essence of sin is it's the anti-creative principle. So when Adam, who's made of dust, falls into sin, he's going to return to his uncreated state. He's going to be made dust again. Uh, his world that was covered with water, when it, it reach, re, reaches its maturity of sin in the days of Noah, God is going to bring that world to an end by covering it with water again. So you see that the, the principle of sin is death, which works in opposition to life. And so uh, what, what, what is Adam to do? Uh, and I think there is no remedy within the horizons of this world. And the remedy, because God is just, he must be just, what is the remedy? There has to be a death, because the, the scripture was, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. So there has to be a, a death of man. We have to have a human death in order to satisfy justice. But it can't be just an ordinary human, because in order to have a program and a plan of redemption, the value of that death has to be infinite and not finite. Does that make sense? In order for there to be an indefinite number of people, a huge company of people to be saved, the value of that it must be authentically a mortal death, but it also must be an infinite value. And the only way that could happen, the only one who can pay an infinite debt is God himself. So it's because of these aspects that that's where the program of salvation begins. God became a man. He had to become an authentic man in order to offer up a human sacrifice of death. But because he's God, his sacrifice is of infinite value. And so its righteousness can be applied to an indefinite number of people, all those who by faith will lay claim to the value of that death. So all of that is involved. But who would have imagined who would have imagined that God would do such a thing? Uh, that he would become a man and we are created lower than the angels, we're told in Hebrews. Who would have imagined that man would do such a thing? Uh, I wrote in a, in a commentary on this. Let's see if I can find it. It's, uh, I wrote a, a couple of sentences about what the significance of this, this intended in the uh, fall of man. And I wrote, and these are in your notes, only the mortal death of an infinite God could satisfy justice and restore mankind. Could God love the world so much? Would he marshal all his mysteries so that the immortal God would become mortal man? The ancient of days would be born of a virgin. The eternal word would become a wordless infant. The most holy God would be defiled by human sin. And the living God would taste death itself. Could God truly love the world so much? And all of that is the background to, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that all of you who believe in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the love of God, that he would, he would lower himself in order to save us. It's, it's the most incredible demonstration of love well, that we could imagine. But because God is God, there's no ambition. He can't, he can't, he can't be higher, That's which, right. is, which is the, the enemy could never have seen this. We were talking about that. Expound a so little the bit. Sin of, the sin, sin began with the angel who's called the cherub who covers in Ezekiel 28. And his ambition was to raise himself up above God. And so then he will tempt the man, who's a creature, to want to be like God. But God is the most high. And God cannot be higher than he is. But what the enemy didn't understand was that God could lower himself. So the, the prime attribute, Paul says this, the prime attribute of Satan is his pride. And pride is the desire to transcend gifts and graces that God has given us in the natural creation. And Satan, it began with Satan, then he tempted man in the same fashion. 
but God went in the other direction. It was, he was equal. The second person of Christ was equal with God. Mm -hmm. In an actual sense, it wasn't robbery to take, take the position of God. He was already divine. But he chose to die. Adam thought he would escape death. Christ thought, knew that he would, he would be born to die, mm -hmm. that God would give him a body, a human body. He would be authentically human, human man, and that his death would satisfy that need that we have for human death, but its value, because he is divine, would be infinite. And which explains the fact that Jesus, when we talk about the life of Christ, he needed to become a man. It, 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 it was, it, there's no way around it. It, yeah. it, it no. had to be a man and it had to be God his, to satisfy his, the two things. His two favorite self-descriptions are the Son of Man and the Son of God. And if you understand the nature of Adam's sin, you understand why he had to be both, authentically both. That's right. So <clears throat> as we talk about uh, this whole idea of framing, and th there's just so many portions of Scripture. I mean, we could spend weeks doing this. But John, in his gospel, um, a great literary device of framing, he, he has these gardens Mm -hmm. And the cross is in the in the midst. Now, I, I, can you sh share share because this is super enlightening on how to read scripture and, mm -hmm. and to see what's going on. Especially, we talked about the Last Supper. Now we're talking about the cross, and the cross happens to be framed in a certain way. You want to expound on that a little bit? Yeah. What what John does in his poetic imagination is to understand if Christ is, as Paul will say, the new Adam the last Adam, then his death took place in a, in a kind of an Eden. Uh, he, so he recreates Jerusalem into the image of the Garden of Eden, where the, the original sin took place, is where the original act of grace will take place. So Christ's suffering and glory takes place between two gardens. His suffering begins in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it ends in the, the glory of the resurrection in the tomb that is nearby the cross. And we call it the garden tomb. So he- Well, Mary thought she was, he was the gardener. Yeah, that's right. And that's not a throwaway line. No, it's that's not. That's profound, he's the new Adam. <clears throat> so now in the midst of those two gardens, he describes the cross. And we need a little help with that because the cross you see in the First century, in, in, the, in the Bible, the cross is a tree. We don't think of it as a tree. We think of it as something made out of wood, but we don't think of it as a tree. But to the, to the imagination of the first century, they thought it was a tree. In fact, in Acts, we find a number of times, and Paul, too, he'll say he was cursed because he was hanged upon a tree. So the cross is a tree. You have to imagine that. And the tree is in the midst of these two gardens. And the language in the midst is invoked because there were two trees in the Garden of Eden that were in the midst. Both of them are said to be in the midst of the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. One was the tree of knowledge, which became the tree of death. Mm -hmm. It was the forbidden tree. We're not to touch it, not to eat of it or anything. And then the other tree was the tree of life. And the tree of life, we have to find. We have to be partakers of that tree of life or we will die. When Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden, it's so that they won't partake of the tree of life. But we know when they're driven out of the garden, they have to find the tree of life or they will perish. And it's the same for all of us. The whole Bible, after their expulsion from Eden, is the quest for the tree of life. Where will we find the tree of life? Because if we don't find it, we will die. That's the, the human story. So the garden itself, there were two trees in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge, the tree of death, and the tree of life. And they're, they're driven out uh, lest they illicitly try to take from the tree of life. And angels, two angels, cherubim angels, are set at the eastern gate. This will become very important next week. With flaming sword to prevent their entry to the tree of life. And so they will then have a life of inevitable uh, wearisome toil and inevitable death. Now, when we come to the New Testament, John says there are two gardens, the garden 
of Gethsemane, where the suffering of Jesus begins, and the, the garden of the tomb, and in the midst, this, this one tree. And he uses the language in the midst by saying Jesus was crucified on, at Golgotha with a thief on his right and his left, and Jesus in the midst. It's always in the midst. Jesus says in Revelation, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So that language in the midst, you find it in Genesis, you find it in Revelation, you find it in the Gospels. So the cross is a tree, but we have one tree. We only have one tree, and that serves both purposes. It's the tree of knowledge that leads to death. How is that? Well, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. He, he didn't know the sin itself, but he knew the, the penalty of sin when our sin was imputed to him on the cross. He, he knew the wrath of God that was due for our sin, and that knowledge then implied his death. But that tree in the midst of the garden transmogrifies itself because that tree also becomes the tree that bears fruit. What is the fruit? The fruit is the wafer and the wine. It's the bread and the wine. That tree bears that fruit. And if anyone by faith partakes of that fruit, of that tree, and believes that God took that penalty upon himself, he suffered in our place. Substitution is the heart of the gospel. And we partake in faith that his death was sufficient to pay our infinite debt. We believe that, and then we believe that God raised him from the dead. We're saved. So the, tr the, the tree of life is the cross at Calvary. That's the end of the quest of the whole Bible. And there are all kinds of trees all the way through the Bible that are pointing us to the tree of life. So the tree of life becomes, Cal what we say, if you partake of the tree of life in Genesis, you will, have ever, you will live forever, right? Well, if anyone by faith partakes of the tree of the cross, then we say the same thing. They will have everlasting life. So we're seeing this replay. Uh, but, of, of but, the but, but I mean, we could, we could spend a lot of time on this, but just briefly, like to me, one of the beautiful pictures of this tree that does something is at the waters of Mara. Absolutely. Can you, yeah. wanna, can you take just a couple minutes and expound on that? Because I think this will be super beneficial for everybody. Yeah. Uh, Israel was, Paul says that Israel was baptized unto Moses in the cloud at the sea. That is, the crossing of the Red Sea was an emblem of baptism, that is, going down into the emblem of the grave, going down into the sea. And then finding the shore of safety is, is a picture of resurrection. Mm -hmm. And uh, they survived, even though they went through the emblem of death, whereas the Egyptians didn't. So that was a picture to Paul of our baptism. Then after God delivers Israel, for three days they're in the wilderness and there's no water. And they're driven mad with this, there's no water. They're, they're, they're desperate. So they forget what God has done and they complain against God and against Moses. And Moses cries out to the Lord and the Lord, because when they come, they come to a place called Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew. It, it was actually a place of waters, but the waters were filled with mineral salts. So they were they couldn't drink them. And that despair of finding water finally and not being able to drink it because it's poison drove them to sin, to the complaining, and not trusting in God. So Moses cried, they cried out to Moses, that Moses cried out to God, and God showed Moses a tree, pointed out a tree, Yarak in Hebrew, which becomes, by the way, the word Torah. <laughs> the Torah is pointing us to the tree of life. He, God points out a tree to, um, to Moses. Moses takes the tree, throws it into the waters, and the waters become sweet. So on the third day, because they were three days without water, on the third day, Israel is delivered from death. And it's by means of a tree that has the power to take that which is bitter and make it sweet. So the gospel is being told all through these stories, all the way through the uh, scripture. Come on, you know that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's cool. <laughs> it's Exodus 15, if you want to read it, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. But all that's, but like, this is, this is part of like reading scripture. There's no throwaway words. They're three days in, three mm -hmm. days in. And, and, and the fact that he points and, you know, Torah is, the Torah's point. I mean, it's just, 
it's, those are just things that you read Exodus 15 and you're like, why wouldn't anybody throw a tree in the water and you just move on, you know? And, and yet there's so much profoundness there. You know, I, just, yeah. I, just, I want them to grasp the concept of that, because I think it's hard for us, you know, because we think of a cross, we just think of a cross. We don't think of a tree, even though the Bible says that Christ died on a tree. You know, we don't even mm-hmm. think of that like when the, um, their feet are bound in the stocks in most translations. Xylon is the Greek word, and it's the, mm-hmm. it's, it's the wood. So, yeah, it's the like, wood. Like, you know, so, you know, when Paul's bound in the stocks in Acts, it's really not stocks. It's, it's xylon is the Greek word. It's wood. His feet are bound in the wood. He's taking on the characteristics of following Christ because his feet are affixed to the wood. We have you know? words that they didn't have in the ancient world. Uh, the stocks, uh, they, they just said he was bound with wood. And so that immobilized him and put him in a, in a right. cruciform position. Uh, the, the tree that Haman raises for Mordecai <laughs> is called a gallows in our translations, but in the Aramaic, it's actually a tree. Uh, so they'll take these words and retranslate. I think one of the modern versions mistranslates the word in Exodus 15. They said God pointed out a log and not a tree. <laughs> The people that are trained are translators, but they're not trained in literature. And so what is actually in the Hebrew text is it's a tree. And so he took the tree. The tree is the the implement that has the potency to take that which is bitter and leads to death and make it it sweet that leads to life. It's awesome. So that's the idea. Now, So I got you sidetracked from John. Sorry, let's get back to the garden. That's my fault. Yeah, so the... But it still was cool what we did, so... Um, my sidetrack was good. Yeah, no, I, I think yeah. that that's, that's good. That's very helpful. This um, is an important thing to keep in mind. This is the way John wants you to understand what Christ did. And we'll understand that with the next slide, but I want you to take a look at this one first. Uh, it shows the suffering of the Savior, and it begins with his prayer when he accepts the cup. You may remember that Luke says that um, his brow broke out in a profound sweat. It was not blood. That's often misunderstood. John, uh, Luke says it was sweat like blood. And, you know, it was heavy and it almost looked like it would coagulate, but it was a sweat like blood. And that's the, that's the emblem. Now that's profoundly significant because we're, what we're going to see is that all of the wounds that are described about Christ on the cross are judgments on Adam. Now, why is that significant? Because he's taking Adam's sin very visually upon himself. And the implication for us is, if Christ could suffer and die for Adam, then perhaps he could suffer and die for me. And he does. And that's that's the glory of this. And the evangelists understood that, so He's, he's taking upon himself the judgments of the first Adam. Now, what does the sweat on the brow have to do with the judgment? You will remember that in Genesis 3, when God confronts the, the man and the woman with their sin, um, it's often misunderstood. God never curses the man and the woman. He can't do that. He's already blessed them in the creation, remember? He blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Um, That must happen, that has to happen. But but it's often misunderstood that he pronounces judgment, but not curses. He curses the serpent. Uh, He will later curse Cain, but he does not curse Adam and Eve. His intentions toward them are redemptive, even at that point. And so, but he punishes them. And so for Adam, his unique punishment is that uh, what is going to be cursed is the ground from which Adam came. Adam came from dust and was created. And because of that, the judgment falls upon the ground and not upon Adam. And the, and the judgment is twofold. You may remember that. Uh, God said that um, by the sweat of your brow, you will earn your bread. So the earth is, instead of bringing forth an abundance of food for the man, like it did in paradise, where God gave every tree uh, for, for, for man, uh, the fruit of the tree for man, mm. now man is going to have to cultivate the ground in order to create 
the grains from which he will make his bread. So the earth will resist him now. He will have to work, he will have to labor, and the resistance that he will feel as he overcomes the resistance of the earth is that his brow will break out in a sweat, and by the sweat of his brow, he will earn his bread. Now, what this means, and why Luke tells us that he began to have this profound sweat in the garden, is because he is preparing, he is earning a bread. Well, what bread is that? That's going to become the bread of life. I mean, that means he's, the evidence of of Adam's making bread is that there is going to be sweat, that is the labor, his labor will be rewarded with bread. The labor of Christ that begins as he takes that judgment upon himself is his brow breaks out in sweat. The second judgment on the ground, remember, it would bring forth sweat from the brow, but it would also bring forth thorns and thistles. Remember that? Um, and that bloody reminder, because man would encounter these thorns and thistles in cultivating the ground, that bloody reminder would remind him of his mortality. It would be painful and remind him of his mortality. And so the brow of Jesus is being identified with the judgments that were brought upon Adam upon the ground. In the garden, he sweats this, this sweat, which means he's producing bread for us, but then that same brow will be crowned with thorns when the Romans mock his kingdom. Remember, they will, take a, a, they will weave together a crown of thorns and they will place that on the head of Jesus. Justly, it would have been placed on the head of Adam, but it's placed on the head of Jesus. The first drawing of blood is the crown of thorns, and he's being identified with Adam, the judgments that Adam caused to be brought upon the ground. He's being identified with that. The brow is identified with the earth. Both the sweat of the brow and the thorns of the brow. He is taking the curses that Adam brought upon the ground upon himself, ultimately with his purpose to redeem the earth, which is wonderful. Paul speaks of that in Romans 8. The earth was, is laboring under Jake. this curse, and it's longing for the bringing forth of the children of God. And it will yeah, how, I mean, like, you know, it, there's, you know, I'm sitting, I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking, you know, there's all these people that run around going, oh, the Bible's not inspired, the Bible's not the Word of God. Like, I mean, when you just talk about these stories, like, who could have put this together and had it all together so good? I mean, you, you have to, you have to, you have to have too much faith to believe in anything. You have you've got to have more faith to believe that there isn't a God than there is to believe that there is one when you're looking at this. I mean, I mean, yeah. this is incredible. I mean, I, I hope you all see this. I mean, it, the, the stitches of all of this is so precise. It's it's incredible. I mean, the thorns, the sweat. I mean, you know, we don't think that way. You know, we read it and go, oh, I wonder why they did that. You know, okay. Well, we'll, we'll see on. the pattern of all of his wounds. You know, on the yeah. cross are are all related to Adam. He is undoing. Like last week, we talked about. He, because we fell into sin sacramentally by partaking of the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, he redeems us sacramentally by the supper, uh, by taking the Seder supper and making that the reversal of the fall. Mm. It's a Seder supper because it's a picture of our being delivered from Egypt and from sin and death, bondage to Pharaoh and taskmasters. <clears throat> We're going to be delivered now from sin and death. So all of it, it's, it's, God is orchestrating all of these particulars to show us the magnificence of Christ. If we lift him up, he'll draw all men to himself. Well, he's, a, he's unraveling all of our problems, which is interesting because uh, um, the book of Revelation says it's the um, unveiling or the apocalypse uh, of mm -hmm. revelation right. of Jesus, mm -hmm. apocalypsis Jesu Christo. Um, it's, it's the revelation of Jesus. Time and revelation is actually going backwards. It is. And it's yeah. funny because you got our pop theology today is trying to cr chronologically show but Revelation is actually going backwards, taking us, unwinding all the sins of the patriarchs back to the garden. And it takes us back to the garden, and the first creation becomes the new creation. Yes. And when we get back to the garden of the new Jerusalem, um, we are invited to partake of the fruit of the tree of life, which is there. So In the midst. It's, it's the, it's the, uh, the idea is that sometimes we talk about our sin, and I wish I could rewind my life and make another choice or something like that. 
God is doing that. He's taking us back to the beginning. But we're not going back to Eden. We're going to something far greater. We're going to the New Jerusalem, which is greater. And Adam and Eve um, were blessed in their creation, but they knew God only as creator. They were like the angels who know God as creator. Right. But we, when we reach the New Jerusalem, we will know God as creator always, but we will know him as redeemer. So Adam praised his bride. She's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But when we are in the New Jerusalem, we will be bone of Christ's bone, flesh of his flesh, but we will be something greater. We will be blood of his very blood. There's an intimacy, a profundity of that. He's showing his profound love for the human family that he did. There was no, when the angels fell, there was no plan of salvation. There was no remedy. And that's why the angels surmounted on the top of the Ark of the Covenant are, and spreading with their wings. They're looking not at each other, the glory of the angels. They're looking at the top of the box. They're looking in a perpetual wonder at the, at the mercy seat where the blood of God redeems man. That's awesome. <laughs> I should also say, by the way, that there are a number of things. God has determined that he will do all things by justice. And sometimes you get the cavil, well, I wasn't in Eden. I didn't choose to disobey God. Why should I, why, were, why was I born in sin? Why does this original sin doctrine apply to me? I wasn't in Eden. Well, that's true. We weren't in Eden, but we have ratified that nature by our own sin, all of us. So we all justly deserve death anyway. But we weren't in Eden. But the other side of that is that we weren't in Calvary either, were we? We didn't make that atonement that was made for us. God is working all things to the benefit of his people whom he loves and to the, to the glory of the church. It, but he's working within a system of justice. He is always just, and he's accomplishing justice so that everyone will see. We'll see these patterns all the way through, but everybody will see. He is holy. He is just. I mean, could he have wished away Adam and Eve, sent them off into perdition? He could have, but he had already blessed them. And so the, the son set his love upon us as betrothal. We are being prepared to be the eternal companion of the Son of God himself. That's your destiny, Christian. That's who you're married to. Your covenant of salvation is a betrothal. The one, the one for whom you're being prepared for the etern to be the eternal companion of spoke galaxies into existence on the fourth day. So who can imagine what destiny, the love that he shows in, in coming down to save us? And that's, I mean, he became a man, but not just a man. Like Paul says in Philippians 2, he became obedient to death. That's right. And not even just to death, but to death on the cross. He came down as far as he could. Satan wants to go up in his ambition and pride, but Christ in his humility came down as far as he could in order to save us. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. But the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. He is our eternal companion, and we are being prepared for him. And we learn to appreciate him and love him more because of the suffering that, get this verb, the suffering that has been given to us. And we in America often forget that. It's given to you not only to... It's, it's grace, to, though. Yeah, grace. that's a grace. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's given. Yeah. It's, it's a grace. It's given to us to suffer for his name. Think about that. It's given to us to suffer. That is a grace. Chorus is grace. It's, it's, it's a gifting to you and me, that suffering is a gift. We look at, we don't look at yeah, it. Yeah, we'll see that when we look at the healing ministry of Jesus. That's going to be pretty amazing. So, anyway, just some thoughts to keep in mind about the nature of His redemption and His atonement. Now, let's fill out the pattern of the woundings of Christ on the cross and show you what 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 John is his unique insight here. Um, I th I think with this and we, one, and we have this for all. This is all on your. Everything's yeah, here, so... You've got yeah. this one. Let me see if I can pull it up here so I don't 
have to look around. Um, we've talked about the brow. You can see that there, the thorns and the sweat of the brow. Uh, it reminds us of Adam and the curse that he brought upon the ground. When Jesus is brought to the cross, the tree, uh, the first thing they do is strip him naked. You remember that? And then they take his garments and they gamble for them. So he is stripped naked. There is the, that's Again, that's an Adamic theme. He understands the, the shameful nakedness. Hmm. Um, so he's actually, you can imagine him taking the place of Adam. It's always, whenever we see these, we'll see them everywhere. There's a substitution of somebody. When Abraham offers up Isaac, um, there is a ram caught by thorns in the horns. We got time. Let's Genesis 22. Let's let's do that. Come on. Well, Just. yeah. Let me. Well, okay. Um, Come on, man. You drove all the way up to Fort Lauderdale. God man. comes. Yeah, that's true. And I might not be able to make it back. I know. Because of all this. I mean, who knows whether you filled up. You're fine. I did. But that gets me back. To the heavenly city, not, you know, but anyway. I don't whatever. know that Fort Lauderdale is the heavenly city. I mean, well, that's a stretch. Dallas is actually the heavenly city. I, I, don't, know, I don't know about that either. We quarrel about this all the time. It certainly has more claim than Cynthiana, Kentucky, right? <laughs> so, so uh, this gets a little bit personal at that was, times. It was rough, but... It's pretty rough, but anyway, it's a lot of fun. Um, we took the gas out of your car while you're sitting here. We Kentuckians it. know how to do that. It's a bunch of thieves. It's called siphoning. <laughs> Genesis 22, though, this is, you, you got to do this because we have a ram. We're not, we're not looking for a ram in the text. It's a third day text. Come on, you got to. God time. comes to Abraham <clears throat> and tells him to take his son, his only son, Isaac, whom he loves. His son, his only son. His unique son. Uh, there's no son like him, is what that means. And so. Um, Take Isaac, which means laughter, referring to the joy that he brought to him. It's like every word is a knife to the heart of Abraham. He says, take him and offer him as a whole burnt offering on a mountain of which I will tell you, a hill on wh of which I will tell you. And uh, immediately the next morning, Abraham is up and he prepares the wood for the sacrifice. And you think, how in the world? This is such a horrendous. Why would God command a father to slaughter his own son? The sacrifice has to be bound and then laid on the wood uh, and pierced and bled out and then immolated in fire. And how in the world could Abraham imagine that he could do such a thing? But Abraham immediately, obediently, he prepares the wood for the sacrifice and they're off from, uh, from South Israel, you know, from uh, Beersheba, I think. They're on their way to Jerusalem. And uh, it says, and on the third day, they reached the place. So on the third day, Isaac is going to be delivered from death uh, and restored to the love of his father. But when God says, offer him as a burnt offering, he's as good as a dead man. And so uh, even though he's stronger than Abraham, Abraham is about 116 or so. You can't get precise. I've tried, but you can't. But it's roughly that age. Uh, Isaac is going to be 16 or so. He's clearly the stronger because when they arrive at the hill, Abraham takes the wood of the sacrifice and places it on the back of his son to carry up the hill. That is a evidence of strength that is beyond Abraham. So Isaac is carrying the wound, the, the wood for his own sacrifice up the hill. And this is Moriah, which is exactly where Golgotha is. So the hill is the same. Jesus will take the wood of the cross on his own back up the same hill. And so Isaac is carrying the wood, and he says, I see the, the wood for the sacrifice and the knife in the fire, but where is the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide a lamb. Uh, he doesn't share with Isaac that he is the lamb of the sacrifice until they reach the summit of the hill. And then Isaac, very clearly could have resisted his father if he's the stronger, but Isaac submitted. He extended his hands to be bound. He submitted his will to the will of his father and laid down upon the wood to receive the piercing of the sacrifice. And Abraham is lifting the knife, and God stays his hand and says, Abraham, Abraham, you know, and, and Isaac is spared death. 
God would not spare his own son, Paul tells us, but he spared Isaac that day. And in, Abraham lifts up his eyes and he sees a ram caught in the thicket with, through, by his horns with, with a thorn bush. So his, his head is crowned with thorns. And they take that ram and sacrifice it in the place of hot in Hebrew, in, in, in substitutionarily in the place of Isaac, and that then is the sacrifice, and Isaac is delivered from, from death. And so, so um, what Moses does is he says, you know, God, God tells Abraham, and Abraham says, he calls the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will, will provide, but he says to him, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. What is the it? It's the Savior who will deliver the world. And so, um, so anyway, and then, um, but the way that Moses has written the story, the question of Isaac is unanswered. Because Isaac said, the fire and the knife, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, in the, in the, you know, the Lord himself will provide the lamb. And the place is named, the Lord will provide. It's looking for the lamb. But what we have is not the lamb, we have a ram, which are not the same thing, which means the question of Isaac is left open and all the way through the Old Testament, you're looking, where is the Lamb of God? And the voice of prophecy comes through John the Baptist. In John chapter 1, when he sees Jesus, he says, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So all of these, all of these scriptures are, are coming together, the deliverance of the Son on the third day, I mean, all of that. And Abraham, you know, Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. I think that's the day he, he rejoices because the Lord spoke to him and told him what all of that intended. So we read the scriptures with such crabbed vision. Moses, as the prince of Egypt, esteemed the reproach, the suffering of Christ, greater riches, not the glory of Christ, but the suffering of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. So they knew all of these stories. They knew them almost as well as we do. And for anybody who's going to school and wants to be a you know, pastor or preacher, Moses had the best education that you could possibly get, yeah. and it prepared him to do what? It prepared him to watch sheep for 40 years. That's right. That was just, God's just graduate that. school. Your education doesn't make you great. Your education puts you in a position to tend sheep. Yeah, and Paul says knowledge puffs up, but the knowledge that he had, which was aborted because he offered himself as deliverer and Israel rejected him, he wasn't ready to deliver Israel until he had been put out to pasture for 40 okay. years, shepherding God's people, and then he's ready. So God is schooling us all of our lives, and that's, that's a great point of rejoicing. So back to the wounds. Let's, yeah, let's, look, let's look back I, My sidetracks are good, though, right? I mean, it's, Genesis 22 was worth listening to. See that. And so, then you got digressing on gas and all that other stuff. Yeah, that's so, right. <laughs> Worried about all of these things that God is already I love taking you, care of. I love you. Yeah, that's right. That's I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll go fill your car with gas. Let's just talk about Jesus. Come on. <laughs> I topped it off already. Okay, that's good. Right. Anyway. We siphoned it because you made fun of Cynthia. Well, that's true. That's right. So. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, so he is uh, made shamefully naked, which reminds us, naked by the tree that's going to be for him the tree of knowledge that will lead to death. Um, he is the seed of the woman, and I think that the prophecy of the seed of the woman, that is the major storyline in Scripture, the quarrel between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And... The prophecy is of a conflict that's to the death, and the seed of the woman will be wounded in the heel because he's bringing down his foot to crush the head of the serpent. The serpent will be crushed in the head, which is a lethal wounding. But before he can crush the head of the serpent, the serpent will, stri the serpent will strike the heel. So the seed of the woman will be left standing, which is the token of triumph, but he will be wounded. John in Revelation sees uh, a lamb as though wounded, a lamb as though having died. So it's all the same kind of imagery. Well, when the spikes go through the feet, that bruises the heel. And I think it marks him out for who he is. Who, is it, who, is the, who are the people who have arranged this? They are the, um, the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And 
John the Baptist, remember they went down to see what John was up to down in the Jordan when he was baptizing? And John, in the spirit of prophecy, looked at them and said, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. You're going to be thrown into the fire. The brood of vipers are the seed of the serpent. So the ones who conspired to bring about the death of Christ were the religious leaders uh, in Jerusalem. Just real quick, to reading Scripture, Luke writes both Luke and Acts, bookends, mm -hmm. word vipers used twice in the New Testament. At the, at the beginning of Luke and at the end of Acts, because remember he calls them vipers who will be thrown into the fire. Paul gets bit by the viper, shakes it off into the fire. Bookends in, in reading scripture. Really powerful stuff. Well, I mean, we can, we'll, we'll, we'll do more of this, but it it's just trying to, trying to put it, seed of the woman. Women don't have seed. Yeah, that's right. And a virgin, virgin, a virgin does not have no, a baby. No, right? but seed, seed of a woman, women do not have seed. That's, that's, that's in every even, language of the world, this, the idea of seed is identified with the male, not the female. That's right. Unless there's so, going to be a virgin birth. Yep. Virgin birth. Um, that's kind of cool, too, why that's happening. But anyway. Now, the last wound of Christ is after he dies, when he's pierced in the side by the Roman spear. And out comes the blood in the water, remember? And that was the wounding that Adam sustained for his bride, uh, when God said, it's not good for the man to be alone, I'll prepare a, um, a bride for Adam, um, he, he brings a profound sleep upon the man. And in that deep sleep, Tardiman Hebrew, it's not he's, just a natural sleep. Huh? He's sinless at he's that still point. He's still innocent. He's yeah, wounded while he's He's sinless. wounded while innocent. So he's a perfect picture of Jesus, isn't he? And he's wounded in the side. God takes the substance out of the side of the man with which he will create the bride. Then he heals Adam of his wounding and awakens him in a garden, and then he presents his bride in all of her beauty and purity. And so Adam suffered that wounding in the side in order for his bride to have her life. Well, Jesus, when he awakened on resurrection morning, did I mention this? We'll talk about the resurrection and what happens there is amazing. But we'll talk you about want to be next here week. next week? It's going to be really good, and hopefully the gas so, crisis will be over by then too. I'm sorry. What? Hopefully the gas crisis will be over by then yeah, too. Yeah, so hopefully just, we'll see. Just playing. Um, but uh, but anyway, when um, so Adam awakens in the garden and receives his bride. When Jesus awakens in resurrection, I think it's probably much like. We do. If any of you have ever had surgery, you, when you come back to consciousness, you examine to see, you know, did the surgeon leave a wounding there? Is there something evident, some scarring or something that's going to take place? Um, Jesus, I think, he was aware. We know that when he met the disciples, he said he showed them his hands and his feet and the side, the wound in the side. When Jesus awakened on resurrection morning, he had memory of all of his wounds but one, and that's the wound in the side because that happened after his death. So he had no human memory of that wounding, but he knew immediately what that was. And he looks out the tomb and there's a garden. And so he knows that if he goes out of that tomb, he's going to be given a bride by the Father. And that, that was anticipated. The author of Hebrews says it was for the joy that was set before him, that is the glory that he would have, that he endured and despised the shame of the cross. Well, what was that glory? What was that joy? That joy was you. You are the bride of Christ. He went through all the shame, despised it. That is, he disregarded it. All the shame and the humiliation of all of that. The, the torment of taking on to himself the imputed sin of all of his people. He suffered all of that with a gladness of heart. The verse in Scripture that's often quoted is... Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You may not know that, but that verse is speaking of the day of Christ's crucifixion in the life of Christ. Sure. Today is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Spirit of God was telling him on that day to rejoice, knowing the 18 hours of torture and all that was in front of him. But he obeyed that. Hebrews says he was joyful. The joy was he was anticipating being with you. Because in Psalm 118, 24, which is the passage that this is the day the Lord has made, 
right before it, it talks about the cornerstone being rejected. And then right after it, it talks about binding the sacrifice to the horns, to the horns of, the of the altar. So the day that the Lord has made that we would rejoice and be glad in, David is telling us, is the day When he Jesus. would be rejected and he would be offered as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So the Psalms are the prayers of the, of the Davidic king in that one. I, it, it amazes me. And we need to be joyful in our suffering. If we are joyful in our suffering, and we're all suffering. I mean, we've had a horrendous year, COVID and all of that, and all the consequences of it. Our culture seems to be fragmenting and falling apart in many ways, and there's so much uncertainty and insecurity. I think that's fair, what's happening socially, what's going to happen financially. All of that shaking that's happening is the background for us, and we should be, of all people, we should be joyful. That's right. Because we know our, our destiny is held. Who's, the, the one directing all of this is God himself. And he's, we have to go through this, for whatever it is, in order, like Hebrews says, the things that can sh be shaken have to be shaken so that we can inherit that which cannot be shaken. So if we understand that and when we encounter suffering and people see us, I think if I could describe the culture that we have now, there's no hope. If we are a joyful, hopeful, hopeful people, serving others like you've created the culture here to be intentional neighbors, all of that, if we show the joy of our faith, that will evangelize. People will say, Why, how can you possibly be joyful? How can you do that with all that, that's going on? There's not a lot to rejoice in, but we have the truth of God. We've got a Savior who loved us, who despised the, the humiliation of the cross so that he could be with us and redeem us forever. And that's our destiny, that's our hope. And if people can see that joy that can't be shaken, they will come, like Peter says, and ask you, right. what is the reason for the joy that you have? And it's the easiest evangelism we could ever accomplish, is to, is to just rejoice in the good things we have in God. And we know our destiny, we know where we're going, we know who's loved us with an everlasting love, who's promised he will never leave us or forsake us, who rejoices over us, Isaiah says, like a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Relationships in this world are fragile, and they break deep relationships, it breaks our heart, but that relationship will never be broken. If we're in the hospital, it comes a time when our, our closest friends and family wear out, they have to go home and rest. But what does Jesus say? I will never leave you or forsake you. We have a marvelous, wonderful Savior. Hmm. How can we not rejoice in him and all that he does for us and has done and the assurance he gives us? If anyone despairs, I mean, David, David, who would have imagined that the one who could write Psalm 23 could fall into sin with Bathsheba? Destroy the, that sin destroyed the kingdom. How did that happen? It happened one night when, when you know, David didn't intend to fall into that, but it just it went from one stage to another that destroyed the kingdom. And, and what about us? Our lives are not yet finished. What sins lie out there that will ensnare us? Jesus knows whatever that is. He has gone to the uttermost. He has died. He's come back with the keys to death and hell. And he says to each one of us, fear not. That's his word. You find, your, you find your satisfaction, your fullness in him alone. He will persevere you. And the more you fall in love with him, that's the best defense you can put up against the wiles of the enemy, I think. Yeah, and and that's why, that's why he chose these first three things in the life of Christ to talk about because we wanted to try to make sure that we understood the gospel, is that you, you, you can't do something to earn salvation. It, 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 there's an infinite injustice. It, it, it's, it can only be secured by Jesus. You know, and this understanding of what Jesus started to unravel at the Last Supper, this, the sacramentalism of that we had eaten 
and, and now we eat and our eyes are open, but it's different because we see him who is our covering. Um, the, the, the understanding of the, the cross that it, he's unraveling the sins of Adam. Like this is, this is why Jesus came, you know, and so many Christians, and, and maybe you find yourself that way. Maybe you're watching, you'll watch this on a recording. You find yourself wondering, am I really a Christian? Am I really saved? The, the, the answer, I mean, you know, John doesn't write in First John, he doesn't say, I write these things so that you might hope to know or that you might feel good on Monday, but maybe not good on Thursday. He says, I write these things that you may know that you have eternal life. And that life is in the Son. You know, if, if we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, if we believe he rose again on the third day, um, and we've confessed that, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, um, Paul says that we can know. And, and when doubt comes in and questions come in, you, we got to know Jesus didn't die for just your sins today. He died for every sin, past, present, and future. And there is a security in that that we sometimes make an insecurity. Mm-hmm. And if we understood the love that he has for you and me, we could say like Paul in Philippians 1.6 that what he started in me, he's going to continue to complete until the day of Jesus. You know, that if God is for us, who can be against us? Mm. Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? Who's going to do it? I mean, Christ has justified us. We, we're, we, we, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, you know, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. I mean, th- 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 those are such encouraging words, and they come in the context of suffering, because mm-hmm. Paul says that the sufferings this present time in Romans 8, 18 are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And he talks about the world suffering and labor pains, the spirit, which is unbelievable, actually groans within us. But yes, once yeah. again, just unbelievable. God comes into our suffering and groans with us. Like, who in the world could have figured that one out? And then he says, because God's working all things together for what? The, the all things, the difficulties of life. I mean, when we can embrace that, you, you can look at the world, you can read the headlines, and so what? Heavenly city's coming, you know, and, and you're talking about John, you know, talk, here he comes out of the tomb, and there's Mary, she's a type of bride, and John 4, you got a type of bride with the woman who's been married, but the real bride is, because this is John, right, John in Revelation, the real bride is the church. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the church, that's, that's, that's you and me. We're, we're the bride, and there is such assurance in that, and that's why we chose to, uh, to do this. And so what I'd like to encourage you to do, because we'll, we'll pray here, but, you know, take a moment, reflect on, you know, if, if you don't know, like, and I, I'm guessing most everybody in here does, but if for some reason you don't know whether or not you're a Christian and you say, I want to know, I want to know that I am, you know, it, it, the answer to that is the gospel, It's the good news. It's that Jesus came to make sure that you and me can can be forgiven. And it it really, it's incredible. That's why it's called the good news, is that this creator God that created the world loved you and me so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would never perish but have everlasting life. And... If you say, I, I want to know, then there's your answer. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again on the third day. But for many of us, you, you may have, I mean, I grew up, Warren, I mean, I was, I saved on Sunday morning. By Sunday afternoon, I'd lost it. But, but praise God, we had church on Sunday night, so I got it again. And then, and then by Monday and Tuesday, I was really bad. But by Wednesday, we had church again on Wednesday night. I was back in. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, forget it. <laughs> but then I got saved again twice on Sunday. You know, I mean, it was just a perpetual hamster wheel. You know, and, and if there's anything that I can tell you that Jesus did not come to give any of us is eternal insecurity. You know, and uh, um, let's take a moment and reflect on that because that is the gospel. And next week, we'll talk about the resurrection, and that's super powerful. So can we take a moment, let's say a word of prayer, and uh, um, we'll stay after as well. Hey, Chip here. I just want to take a moment and say thanks so much 
for, for watching Reaching the Next Generation. Um, I really hope that this was something that was beneficial to you. And what I would ask, if you really enjoyed this, would you like it? Would you subscribe to it? Would you give us some comments? And most importantly, would you share it? Um, I believe with all of my heart that the material and the content that we have on this channel truly can make a difference and resource pastors and leaders and Christians. And you can help us to truly help others to reach the next generation. Thanks so much for being a part of our channel.